Well, I guess we've got a 1980s Naomi, that's great. Don't you just love when a wig doesn't turn out the way that you want it to? I'm meant to be a high school girl. Yeah, I'll give you a high school girl. I look like a high school girl. You look older than you normally do. Do you want to say drag? Yeah. Costumes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to get back to my review now. Do that. <laughs> So we're going to start off book two with chapter one, which is called Classmates. So if you guys remember where we left off on book one, Ayumi had kind of gotten possessed. Something she wasn't quite acting herself. In fact, she was just sort of staring off into the distance and saying she needed to go to you, Sensei. Well, that's where we pick off on book two. Pick off, well done. Dragon. I can't see this, but I'm actually like adjusting this wig like every five minutes into this review. I hate it. It feels so gross on my head. <laughs> she kind of snaps out of it after a while and starts yelling at Kishinuma saying that she needs to go find you sensei. And Kishinuma is a massive simp to Ayumi. <laughs> so um, he, he agrees. He actually agrees and says that if she starts hyperventilating or anything like that, then the two would immediately go back to the classroom. However, Kishinuma does worry that Yusensei might return, and if she does return, she won't know that they've left by choice. So he asks Ayumi for a pen. She does have a pen, but she has no paper, so they resort to writing on the desk. With that, he writes, Yusensei, we went to find you. If you come back and see this while we're gone, wait here. We'll be right back. Kishinuma and Shinazaki. The two really smartly go out into the hallways, which is really dark at this point because there's no lights. So Kishinuma asks Ayumi if she has any of these very convenient candles she just carries around everywhere with her because she's really spiritual and shit. So she carries around candles wherever she goes. And lo and behold, she actually does. In fact, it makes a point in the manga of her pulling out all these candles and Kishinuma just going, where the hell does she pull these from? Which, I mean, self-aware, that's good. Um, and yeah, so she puts it down and lights it up. And this, if you have played the games, is actually saving points in the games. If you click on uh, one of the Ayumi's candles, it's a saving point, so. Yeah, but in the manga, it's actually to hopefully communicate with the other students that they had been there. So even though they're in a different timeline, a uh, timeline nexus, whatever, hopefully they'll be able to see the candles still. The two go to the entrance, which is the locker room, which Naomi and Seiko had been in before uh, with all the little tiny shoes of the elementary school and things like that just lined up everywhere and Ayumi gets cold. Kishinuma remembers a time when Naomi had gotten cold in the classroom and Satoshi had given her his jacket to warm her up. And we all know Kishinuma is a massive simp to Ayumi, so he goes and tries to give her his jacket um, but Ayumi is just as dense as I am and she doesn't realize that he's trying to like make her warm and flirt with her and she's like no I can't take that because then you'll be cold and he's like oh okay then I guess I okay and he just takes his jacket back and puts it back on <laughs> however when he puts this jacket back on it gets caught on something and obviously he turns around to see what this jacket got caught on when he was putting it back and there he finds four skeletal bodies. Thanks manga, you're really making this body count easy for me, aren't you? <laughs> Ayumi starts hyperventilating again because she can hear the bodies talking. <laughs> um, Kishinoba doesn't know what the hell to do so he's just like, we gotta go and so they scooby-doo run it out of there. When they stop, uh, Kishinuma starts rubbing Ayumi's back, trying to help her breathe again, and she just expresses that she's worried about Satoshi. 
Ishinuma starts to express that if anything were to happen to her, but then he gets stopped because they see a light in a classroom. They see this light in the classroom and they hope it's you, Sensei. So they go into the classroom and <laughs> the door slams behind them and they can't get out. Uh, Kishinum is a bit freaked out and he's like, oh my god, but Ayumi is simply just staring into a corner again and she just points over to this corner and there's nothing in the corner, but she She's pointing to it, and she may as well be pointing into the next chapter because we are moving now on to chapter, chapter two. <laughs> chapter two is called Signs. What do you know it? In this corner that Ayumi is pointing towards, there is a spirit boy. And this spirit boy is pretty important to remember. Uh, he has a slushed open stomach and his tongue is missing. He runs towards Kishinuma and jumps on him, and then vanishes. Ayumi starts hyperventilating version 5.20 billion. <laughs> I don't know if that's a number. <laughs> she like pile dives Kishinuma, and they both fall on the floor, and she's like hugging him. And you're like, oh, it's really cute for like five minutes. Whilst they are on the floor, Kishinuma sees uh, a sort of lever he doesn't really know where it goes to but he looks up following the trail and sees piano wires and you just hello <clears throat> you know piano wires are not a good sign when the two fell this lever had gotten triggered and when ayumi stood back up again the piano wires sort of the best way I can describe it is like clasped together. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the boat scene in that horror movie where the, like all the people get their like bodies split in half, but it's like that, but in several pieces. And Ayumi, um, yep, she's basically just split into four different pieces from these piano wires. Kishinuma, of course, is in absolute disbelief of what just happened and he drops to the floor and he's like oh my god and then he gets split into like four pieces as well by more piano wire remember this one very vividly um because this is actually a death in the game that you can get um it's a wrong end um if you walk i think it's just if you walk down a corridor or something like that it's it's not in the classroom or anything like that and it's quite late on in the game um, but yeah, Ayumi can get split in several bits by piano wire. It's quite a common trap in the school. So when I was reading book two, I realized I missed out an important uh, fact for you guys to remember for this book. And that is to do with the crystal that uh, Yu Sensei gave to Ayumi before she went off go to go do her thing. The one for protection? Yeah, that comes up again and I should have mentioned that, but I didn't. <laughs> Kishinuma, after this scene plays out, is woken up by a Yumi over the top of him, like shaking him and waking him up. Turns out it had all just been a vision, but what wasn't a vision is that he had been strangling himself. After the boy had jumped on top of him and like disappeared, Kishinuma immediately started strangling himself and dropped to the floor. And a Yumi couldn't get him to stop until that crystal broke. You need to remember this. This is important. So after that ordeal, the two leave down the corridor and start wandering again. Um, and that's when they hear TV static. This TV static is coming from the custodian's office. Important to remember. <laughs> um, it comes from the custodian's office, but when they go in there, they find a body which Kishinuma tells Ayumi to wait whilst he goes and investigates. So this body has its head caved in and just outside the office, the two had also seen a body with its head caved in. 
um, and it's sort of become a running thing that the two have seen on their way there. Kishinuma turns around from the body and Ayumi is possessed. Again, I should really start doing a count for how many times Ayumi gets possessed because Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, she's possessed. Oh god, this book tests my sanity. Okay, so after he sees that she's possessed, she Ayumi does a literal Naruto run, I'm not joking, down this corridor, stomping on the body as she goes. She literally just like <laughs> Naruto runs over the top of this body and gets to the end of the hallway again. Um, and Kishinuma obviously runs after her like, <laughs> what the hell? And um, she just turns around and starts yelling at him that it's her daughter's seventh birthday. <laughs> I told you this, this manga was weird. <laughs> and that's the end of chapter two. <laughs> I need a drink. <laughs> I forgot about this bit. <laughs> okay, um, in the locker room, Shinazaki is literally drooling and like wide-eyed, like staring. I need to stop laughing. Okay, I've composed myself enough now. So Ayumi is all wide-eyed and drooling and stuff like that and she turns to Kishinuma and he's wondering what's going on and she just says that she wants to go on a picnic. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> she says that she's going to go on a pip <laughs> Fuck me. She says that they're going to go on a picnic. <laughs> and Kishinuma slaps her and tells her to snap out of it. She knows, just like that, she's, she's out of it in seconds and she doesn't remember what she just did. Like, she has no recollection. In fact, she questions Kishinuma for why he's looking at her like that and if she has something on her face. <laughs> Probably from that picnic. <laughs> Kishinuma like takes a moment of dear god but then he continues on being a simp and he's like oh were you sleepwalking? Do you not remember coming to the entrance? And she's like what? No I wouldn't do that and they start like joking around playfully with each other flirting and shit but they're not a couple yet serious face. As the two are joking around, Ayumi sees the ghost boy from before behind Kishinuma and reaching out to try and grab him. The two begin running immediately, obviously if you see that behind you, you're gonna run. Um, and as they're running down the corridor, Ayumi stops and says that she hears a creaking noise. And Kishinuma brushes it off and says, well, yeah, we're in an old building with holes in it and shit. I, I, pfft, I mean, it makes sense. But then Ayumi can somehow tell that it's not the building that's making this creaking noise, it's a different kind of creaking noise. I am gonna get serious here now. Actually, get serious. So the two follow this noise of the creaking into the girl's bathroom. And yes, you can already see where this is going. When the two enter, they see a black shadow of a person on the floor and the stall that this shadow is in front of is just covered in blood and there is a piece of rope hanging from the, the sort of beam at the top, but it's been cut. Ayumi begins to explain that somebody had died in that bathroom and that it was a painful and excruciating death. She explains to Kishinuma that they couldn't even cry out for help and that they were just kept being pulled down and were just choking. Ayumi breaks down into tears, just sobbing, and Kishinuma questions how she can tell all that just from being in the bathroom. Obviously, we have realised at this point that Ayumi has a sort of connection with... Really? And Kishinuma asks how she can tell all that just from the bathroom, and she said she can hear the spirits and stuff talking, and she can sense the 
tragedy had happened in that bathroom. Obviously they have no idea, but we know that that is where Seiko had hung herself and where Naomi had been crying in front of the stall in the last, I was say episode, but like bug. <laughs> Kishinuma gives Ayumi his handkerchief to sort of dry off her face and the two are cute for a moment again, um, talking and just being cute <laughs> um, before the two go off into the corridors again. And Kishinuma is at this point very worried about Ayumi's condition. She's just sort of deteriorating more and more, you know, having more panic attacks, hyperventilating more, sobbing more, that kind of thing. So he suggests that the two go to the nurse's office for her to go and lay down for a bit. Upon entering the nurse's office, the two find Mayu. And if you guys remember Mayu from the start, she's just chilling. She's chilling in the nurse's office. The only difference is, is she's holding the hands of two ghost children. <laughs> These ghost children are two little girls. One has their head cut clean in half. Only the bottom of the head is left. The other girl is missing her left eye. Left eye. <laughs> and that's the end of chapter three. We now move on to chapter four, which is called The Abyss. The two beg Mayu to come away from the two ghost girls, but Mayu reassures them that these two girls aren't going to hurt them. And the little girl with half a head missing actually gurgles Onichan. And no, not Onichan as in big brother, Onichan as in big sister. Mayu says that that's correct and actually just sort of starts laughing with the girl and they seem really affectionate and sweet together. Then there's this odd little cutscene, which is the first time it's happened, um, where we are cut from like the main trio and we go to see some woman who we don't know yet um, finding a doll like a random, I think it's like a, it looks like a china doll, I'm not entirely sure, They're like a porcelain doll. I don't really know how to describe it, um, I'll insert a picture. But she finds this doll and is finally like, aha, I found you. And then we cut back to the trio again. It's really bizarre, but like, okay. Mayu reassures the girls. I'm so sorry, if you keep hearing like noises like that, by the way, it's T, my bearded dragon. He's just an absolute nightmare. Let's see if I can turn it up. He's up there, he's just doing shit. <laughs> when we go back to the three again, Mayu reassures Ayumi and Kishinuma that they shouldn't be scared of the kids and that they should actually feel sorry for the two children. And that's when she hands them a newspaper clipping. This newspaper is a report of a follow-up on the four kidnappings that Naomi had discovered previously on the notice board. It says, the teacher was arrested after being found responsible for the children's deaths. The children had died from blood loss or asphyxiation after having their tongues cut out by a pair of cloth scissors. All children were mutilated, one having half their head removed. There are four children pictured in the newspaper. And this is where we find out the names of the children that we have been seeing throughout and the ones that were murdered. I'm going to really, really butcher the second name and I want to be really respectful, so I am going to Google translate it for you guys. The little boy with his stomach cut open and his tongue missing was called Ryu, and I'm gonna play the second name on here. Ryo Yoshizawa. Yoshizawa! <laughs> Why do they say it like that? That doesn't help! The girl with her left eye missing is called Yukiko. Yukiko? Tokiko! Tokiko! Not Yukiko. Tokiko! <laughs> this one is easy. The girl with half her head missing is called Yuki Kano. The final fourth girl's name is unknown. The name of this girl is unknown because the piece of newspaper that Ayumi had been given had been cut off at the bottom which had the girl's name on it. It simply reads, when investigators arrived on the scene, one of the children was blank, full stop, blank, 
blood blank. When I say blank, that's obviously where things have been scribbled out or blood, I think it, I think it was blood splatter had been put on the top of it so they, they couldn't read it. Mayu explains to Ayumi and Kishinuma that these two children were the ones from that murder and that they had been killed in the elementary school and that she was going to stay with them forever. And trying to convince her does not work. All of a sudden, a certain little boy comes up behind Kishinuma, calling him Onichan, and saying that he wants him to stay too, as he tries to grab at him. Of course, this is the boy with his stomach split open and his tongue missing, Ryu. He manages to grab hold of the two, and as soon as he touches them, they are in agony, saying that their heads hurt so badly they thought they were going to split open. Then we have a deus ex machina. The girl from the cutscene that we haven't met yet appears in front of them. I'm not even joking. Like she doesn't walk into the classroom or anything like that. Like the, there's nothing like that. She literally just appears <laughs> in front of them. She turns to Ayumi and Kishinuma and explains that these children are the ones that created Tenjin Elementary School. The ones that had created this awful world that they were now trapped in. <laughs> she throws holy water at them. I'm not joking. <laughs> and as she throws holy water at them and they recoil, she grabs Kishinuma and Ayumi and sort of drags them out of the nurse's office. Now, I'm very conflicted with this scene because I feel really sorry for the children. You can see team moving up there, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> But Ryu starts to cry and starts whimpering on Nichan and asking him to come back, regardless of the fact that he had just like mentally tortured the two. And Mayu hugs him into her and reassures him that she's not going anywhere and she is going to stay with him. It's just, just quite sad, really. I, I just, the whole thing's kind of sad. Like I joke about it, but it is sad. <laughs> So back in the hallway with Ayumi and Kishinuma, um, this woman just sort of has a bottle in her hand and just says, drink this, and like puts it to their lip. I'm gonna start that again. So she puts this bottle, like gives this bottle to them and says, drink it, and they just drink it. And luckily it was a restorative, they call it in the, in the manga and it heals them of the headaches but like that could have been anything and they don't know this woman i mean she appeared out of nowhere and threw holy water on some children i mean <laughs> that is when we are finally introduced to her as a character her name naho sanoki-san or just naho is a lot easier to say <laughs> and she very conveniently is a I was gonna say psycho student. <laughs> I meant psychic. She's a psychic student. That's why Ayumi knows her. She ran a website and her uh, psychic sort of page and consultations got very famous and she even wrote a book which she got an award for. And yes, you guys are probably already caught up right now, but if not, I'm gonna tell you something that's gonna blow your minds. <laughs> Naho was the one to post the Sachiko Ever After charm on that website that Ayumi went to get that. Ayumi explains that everyone was really worried because she posted that charm and then disappeared. Which just baffles me even more as to why she thought this was a good idea to do this psycho charm. Psycho? Psychic! <laughs> and that's when Naho re reveals that she's a ghost and is trapped in the school. Yep, she died in the school too. And Ayumi's all like... <laughs> However, unlike the other spirits, Naho seems to be a good spirit and actually wants to get out and solve this mystery and stuff like that. And she's done a lot of research and she believes that if she can give the children a proper send-off, the ones who were murdered and had created Tenjin Elementary School in the first place, then the walls of this dimension would break down and they would all be freed. She explains that they must hear the killer's apology. And she also explains that the killer 
is still inside the school and he wields a massive hammer. You remember the uh, corpses that had their heads bashed in from before? That's his doing. <laughs> she explains that when he was alive, he did regret what he did. And unfortunately, after 30 years in the school wandering this dimension, he had gone mad and couldn't stop killing now. And that's when she produces the doll that she had received during that cutscene that was really bizarrely placed. And this doll had been beside the killer his entire life and now talked and repeated what he said when he was alive. This creepy ass doll starts repeating I'm sorry over and over again in the killer's voice. Ayumi gets excited over this prospect and she runs back into the nurse's office with the other two to play this recording to the two children and hopefully get Mayu out of that situation. Yumi holds this doll out toward them and this doll begins apologizing and starts like floating and stuff like in the air and Naho starts yelling at the children to go back to their parents and it's actually really sad this little bit the children are sort of confused for a moment before they all start crying and repeating mummy over and over again and saying that they miss they miss their mothers and they wanted to go to them and they just seemed really lost in that moment but this sad moment turns to very disturbing in about 0.3 seconds which happens a lot in this manga um they they begin screaming and Mayu starts levitating. You can see where this is going already. The scene is very, um, yeah. So that's Mayu now. Yep. Ayumi, Kishinuma and Naho all run after her, obviously. And they reach the end of the corridor and Ayumi starts screaming, saying that they were supposed to be friends forever, obviously. Mayu was the reason they did this charm in the first place, so that they could stay friends forever, because she was leaving. And now she's just guts on the wall. Naho is a lot less um, sympathetic, and just sort of stomps on the doll and says, another failure, like, yeah, you think? <laughs> Ayumi runs off again, I swear to god this girl. Anyway, she runs off and Kishinuma tries to chase after her again. But it doesn't quite work out this time because you remember the killer from before? With his big hammer? Yeah, he comes up behind Kishinuma. Bonk, he gets vibe checked. He fails the vibe checked and gets dragged away. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of chapter 4! So chapter 4 failed the vibe check. We are now on to chapter 5, which is just called A Ray of Hope. In this chapter, we return to Naomi. I don't know what that was. <laughs> Naomi is still sobbing over Seiko's body in the bathroom. When she she's approached by Neho. Neho? I, I'm probably not saying her, her name right, I'm just gonna say this now, but like Naho, Neho, na na I don't know. I, <laughs> she explains that Seiko had been touched by the curse of the school. And of course Naomi questions what the hell she's on about. Naho explains that it affects all the minds of the people who touch it, causing them to go mad or harm those around them without warning. Some harm themselves instead. She then goes on to explain that Naomi is now the only living person left in her dimension. Very kindly says that she's going to die alone, and then disappears. She has a habit of doing this. <laughs> Naomi of course freaks out and like legs it out of the bathroom trying to find Neho like, what the hell are you talking about? Um, and she, she, yeah, she falls down the stairs. <laughs> 
Okay, I jumped the gun a little bit to make a joke. Uh, she doesn't fall down the stairs yet. She actually just walks down the corridor and her phone begins ringing. And on her phone screen, it says, mum. Uh, so Naomi gets overjoyed and answers the call. Naomi can hear her mother calling her name and asking her where she is and saying that anyone who had her to please just keep her safe. And even though Naomi is replying to her, she, she can't hear her. Then out of nowhere, she hears a very creepy, help me, down the phone. And it freaks her out so much, she, she, it gets a yeet from her hand down the stairs. And then she falls down the stairs, going to retrieve it. The splint on her ankle that Seiko had made had split basically um, when she tripped down the stairs. It had split in half and obviously her ankle gave out. And she just sort of fell to the bottom of the stairs and lay there sobbing. She luckily isn't any more hurt, but her mentality clearly at this point is just gone. She lays there crying, wishing for Seiko and saying that she can't do this anymore. And the page turns black. Without even beginning a new chapter, we pick up with Satoshi and Yuka after the page had turned black. The two of them had come across a very friendly little spirit. Uh, it was just a girl from, uh, who was in a uniform who had clearly been from another school um, and had died in there, explaining to them all about the dimensions, basically so that we know at this point that they, everybody knows about the different dimensions and stuff, but we don't have to have another repeat of people explaining how it all works and stuff, because we've heard it like three times now. The girl apologises for the fact that they won't be able to find their friends and wishes them the best of luck before disappearing. She's a very nice ghost girl, I really wish she showed up again, but she doesn't, so great. Yuka begins worrying, obviously, that they won't get out after what that girl said, but Satoshi reassures her that they will get out and um, they start exploring the classroom that they're in. And that's when Satoshi finds the note that Ayumi and Kishinuma had left for you, Sensei, on the desk. Satoshi decides to go and look and obviously brings Yuka with him and he uses his phone light as the light to guide his way. And yes, that is the phone light that you, Sensei, had seen across the way when she went to go follow it and that's how she got trapped underneath the little cabinet. <laughs> I can't remember if this point is important or not, but I've put it in my notes, so I'm gonna guess it is important. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll only know if it's important after I start editing and I'm like, oh yeah, that is important for later. Anyway, Fuka gives Satoshi a good luck charm, which is a little bottle of beads which are scented of caramel. And apparently this means something. Now I did look it up, um, I couldn't quite find anything, like, I know there's different meanings of uh, smells of perfume in Japan and things like that. However, when I looked up caramel, um, I wasn't entirely sure. I believe it's something to do with love, which would explain a lot. Go, yes, there is some incesty things going on, I'm warning you now. Um, but I'm not 100% sure, don't quote me on that. Not the incesty stuff, I mean like the what caramel means in scent when you give it to somebody in Japan. Um, so yeah, so she gives that and obviously she explains that there is another meaning to this caramel scent and when Satoshi asks, she's just like, no, I'm not gonna tell you because then you'll be weirded out. No shit, Sherlock. After that, she literally skips down the hallway and then she falls over. <laughs> Sorry, that's not funny. Um, but she scrapes her knee. And Satoshi obviously runs over and he's like, are you okay? And he crouches down before her to sort of like check her knee. And he sees hair, like long black hair, and a pair of bare feet beside Yuka's. Mm. And that's where chapter five ends. We are now on to chapter six, which is called Change. Satoshi slowly looks up and that's when he sees that there's a little ghost girl stood beside Yuka. 
Now, obviously, Satoshi and Yuka don't know who this girl is, but if you remember previously, this is the girl in the red dress that Seiko and Naomi had seen before, the one who had destroyed Seiko's charm piece. The girl picks Yuka up. They are around the same age, it appears, or she's younger, but the same height. She picks her up and levitates her up, and Satoshi obviously is yelling at her to put her down and tries to get her to stop, like, running over and stuff. <laughs> and the girl, okay, the girl in the red dress, she has this little cat plushie, and she just yeets it at, <laughs> at Satoshi and, like, knocks him down on the floor and then just <laughs> out of the way with Yuka. It's... I mean, if it works. <laughs> so Toshi gets back up and he runs after them in the direction that he was and he finds Yuka on top of a cabinet and she's unharmed. It just seemed like the girl was playing with her. Uh, Yuka says that actually. She says, I wasn't really scared. It just seemed like she was trying to play with me. And like I said before, like in the manga, you can see the, the girl in the red dress literally just pops Yuka on top of the cabinet and then just goes, bye, and then just leaves. <laughs> So, yeah. So after this, the two go to the nurse's office. I don't know what it is with this nurse's office that they're all so obsessed with, but they go to the nurse's office and they go and lay down in the same bed that Seiko and Naomi were laying previously. <laughs> and that's when Yuka, for the first time of many times in this manga and in the games, reveals that she needs to pee. So the two leave the nurse's office to go and find a bathroom. However, upon leaving the nurse's office, they see a brand new black shadowed mark, exactly like the one that Ayumi had seen in front of the girl's bathroom stall, dragged across from, like the hallway from the door of the nurse's office, which wasn't there when they first came in. They follow this black trail down to the bottom of the corridor and that's when they hear the click of a phone. They look over and they see Moshige taking photos of Mayu's guts. Yep, this is going where you think it's going. <laughs> Moshige asks if the two have seen Mayu because he needs to be by her side because she's probably terrified out in the school all alone. They of course haven't so he goes off on his own to go and find Mayu. Satoshi and Yuka were like no he wasn't taking photos we were just mistaken for something. But we follow Moshige down the corridor where we are revealed that he has taken several photos of not just Mayu's guts but of several of the corpses around the school and other gory bits and pieces and was like overly happy about seeing these pictures if you catch my drift. And thank the Lord that is the end of chapter six and we move on to chapter seven. Chapter seven is called Another Nightmare. The two continue on their search for a bathroom when they walk down the corridor and come to a dead end when another earthquake happens and this time after the earthquake finishes a, a door has appeared at the end of the corridor which when they open leads them straight to the outdoors it's the first time we have been outside in two books satoshi looks around and sees that the forest is so dense that he can't even see through it like there is it's just blackness because of how thick this forest is. It's thick boy. <laughs> He's looking around, like quite amazed by it when Yuka insists on peeing again. Like she brings up her need to pee so much. <laughs> but yeah, so the two continue on down this little, the best way I can describe it is like a little walkway with um, like a, a roof over the top of it. Uh, to obviously stop rain and stuff, and it's when they enter the next building, which is the Annex. Yeah. <laughs> Note that this building 
the air in this building feels considerably heavier than it did in the last building and they feel a lot more creeped out and just not quite right. But then they hear the noise of running. The two hide, obviously, and, you know, hide behind a locker when they see a girl run straight past them. A an alive girl, somebody that was real, from a different school, but she was alive. Satoshi is obviously relieved by this and runs after her with Yuka and manages to grab hold of her and stop her. But upon trying to question her on anything, the girl appears to be manic and screams at them that they can't trust anybody before shoving him away and running off again. We learn that her name is Mitsuki Yamato. She goes to Byakudan Senior High and she's in class two to four. And this is important to remember for later. Satoshi and Yuka continue on walking, figuring that she's a lost cause and to try and find a bathroom. But every bathroom they go into is locked or just not usable in some way, shape or form of course it is. For this reason, Satoshi sends Yuka outside into the little walkway that they walked on before to go and pee in the woods. He tells her to shout if anything happens or if she needs him and Yuka goes out and Satoshi stays in. However, when Yuka's about to climb over the little fencing to get to the woods, the girl with the missing eye is. Only this time, she's a lot more menacing. She's holding a pair of cloth scissors up like this, snipping them together and saying that she needs her tongue back and for Yuka to give it back. Yuka panics and makes a break for it. She runs straight back into the building which she had just come from with Satoshi, slamming the door behind her because doors stop ghosts. Anyway, um, yeah, Satoshi's gone. <laughs> He's not there um, and she can't find him anywhere, in fact. So she starts walking away from the main entrance after hearing the clicking noise of something. So she follows this clicking noise and who does she find? Hoshige. Hoshige is stood over the top of the dead body of the girl we just met. The one who was alive no more than two minutes ago. The one that said not to trust anyone? Yep, her. He was stood over her body taking photos. How did she die? Her stomach was cut open. That's the end of chapter seven and we move on to chapter eight, which is called Lonely Little Bird. Love this chapter because my husband appears in this chapter. <laughs> okay, so, um, Yuka obviously starts explaining to Moshige that she'd been separated from her brother and she couldn't find him anywhere. And Moshige grins and then takes a photo of Yuka while she's crying. Then very, very creepily tells her to come to him so that they can go and look for him together. Yuka obviously is freaked out and starts running away from him and he starts running after her. Or like, Yuka runs straight into the art room to go and hide from Moshige. She goes and hides under a desk. However, as soon as she gets under that desk, there's another girl there. And it looks that this girl's around her age, probably a little bit older, and she's alive. She's not a ghost or anything. And she's just sat there under the desk. Yuka tries to talk to her and asks if she wants to hide with her or who she's hiding from, but the girl doesn't reply. And it becomes very clear to the readers that this girl has been affected by the madness of the school. Um, Trichotillomania warning or anything like that really. Um, when Moshige starts calling out to Yuka, the girl beside Yuka begins pulling her hair out, like hard, like chunks of it, just pulling it out. And obviously Yuka's freaked out by this and tries to stop her by, I don't know why they all just leap onto each other, but they do. Anyway, Yuka like jumps on her to try and stop her and the two fall out from underneath the desk. 
Moshige obviously hears this and runs over thinking he's found Yuka. Yuka tries to get the girls to go back under the desk, but she's just out of it. So Yuka crawls back under the desk, whereas the girl stays out. Moshige goes over and when he tries to grab the girl, the girl just jumps on him and like he freaks out and like shoves her off him and starts mumbling that he nearly had the last of his collection. After he leaves, Yuka comes out from under the desk and apologises to the girl for not being able to help her. Uh, the girl just mumbles more about being a lonely little bird, hence where the title comes from, before Yuka leaves. She goes back to the place where Satoshi had previously been, having lost all of the hope of finding him elsewhere, and that's when she sees a figure of a man. Yuka very naively runs straight over to this figure and jumps on this figure, assuming it's Satoshi, saying how scared she was that she'd lost him. The man pushes her away and sort of holds her by the shoulders. And it's definitely not Satoshi, but it is my husband. That is when we are true. <laughs> Sorry. That is when we are introduced to Kizumi. Kizumi is like a fan favourite of a lot of people in Cole's party just solely because he's hot I'm not even joking, like that's pretty much it <laughs> and he's pretty like, you'll discover more as like the, the manga goes along but yeah um, he introduces himself as Kizumi he says he is a second year of Byakudan High School you guys remember that name? it's the same name as the girl who had just been murdered who Satoshi tried to talk to before. They are from the same school. And that's where chapter eight ends. And we are now onto the last chapter of book two, chapter nine, called An Outstretched Hand. So Yuka introduces herself in return to Kazumi and says that she's lost her brother and starts crying again, obviously. And Kazumi says, that he's also lost his little sister and couldn't imagine her being alone in Yuka state in such a place and that if she wanted to come with him to go and find his little sister then they could look for Satoshi on their way and Yuka agrees. The two go off in search, you know, shouting for Satoshi um, but not being able to find him anywhere and that's when Kizumi explains that there's a killer in the building, obviously referring to the actual children killer, not the children themselves. Yuka gets scared, but Kizumi reassures her and pats her on the head and there's a hole in the stairs like that they're going up, like a massive hole in it, so he picks her up like bridal style and just sort of carries her uh, up the stairs until they get to the top. Yuka's all flustered and being all weird again and she's like, ooh, give me then. I <laughs> They come across the place where Moshige was with the dead girl. However, her body was gone. It had been moved or disappeared or something. So when they go into the room, they see a boy crouched over her body. It was there, it had just been moved into the room and propped up against the wall, so she was sat back against the wall. That is when we are introduced to Kensuke Kurosaki. I think I've got that right. He is Kizumi's classmate and seems ecstatic that he is alive and like jumps on to hug him. Kizumi, however, just seems very confused and is just like, whoa, uh, okay. Kensuke introduces himself to Yuka and explains the whole story of how his class had gotten stuck there after doing the Sachiko Ever After charm and Yuka explains that they had also done the same charm. We learn that the girl that had been killed, this is when we actually learned her name but I just thought it was easier to give her name when we were first introduced to her, but it turns out that this girl was in sort of a relationship with Kensuke, kind of like he had a massive crush on her and um, he just found her dead and believes it was one of the children uh, with the scissors who had cut her open and Yuka's actually very relieved because she thought Moshige had murdered the girl. 
is some positive words from Kinsuke. The three go off again to go find Satoshi together. Yuka needs to pee again. So they find a bathroom this time, but it is covered in talismans and therefore they can't get in. I'm not quite sure about the, like the mechanics behind all that. I'm sure if you're more spiritual than I am, you'll know more about why they couldn't do that, but they couldn't get in uh, until Kensuke presents a crystal that the girl who was murdered had and the crystal breaks all the talismans and they can get into the bathroom. So Yuka goes into the bathroom and Kensuke starts talking about this girl called Hanuma-san, uh, which we've not been introduced before, um, that they went hiking with, with Kizami and stuff like that, and starts saying about like how wonderful it was. And when Kizami stops him with a knife to the gut, yeah. He tells Kensuke not to talk about Nisan and that he's finally free from her in this world and that he's free from the grips of this horrible woman. Kizumi reveals that he was the one to murder his classmate, the girl that we had met previously. And this is why she still had an intact crystal. If you guys remember the crystal that Yu Sensei had given a Yumi and Kinoshima, too many Ks, um, <laughs> Kinoshima, they it had broken um, when that little boy jumped on top of Kishinuma, and it had spared their lives. Otherwise, that trap that he envisioned wouldn't have just been a vision; that would have been their reality. But the crystal spared them, and it broke because it had been used. The reason this girl had a full crystal was because she wasn't murdered by the ghost children. She was murdered by a human. If she was murdered by the ghost children, the crystal would have broken and she would have had her life spared. Which is why she still had an intact crystal, whereas every other one had broken. Doesn't tell you that in the manga. You just gotta use your brain. <laughs> he then goes and picks Ketsuke into the like back and he falls into a hole in the floor and that's when Kizumi says that it doesn't matter if you are killed by the living or the dead either way nobody's going to make it out alive and that's where we end chapter 9 and subsequently the second book of the mega series Thank you everybody for watching this far. I hope you enjoyed this review as much as you enjoyed the last one, or maybe hopefully more, <laughs> I don't really know. Um, but we will be moving on to book three uh, next, and book three is halfway through the series. There are five books in the main series, and book three is obviously the middle. So we are nearly through, uh, just another two books to go through after number three so I hope you stick around to the very end after I have done these manga reviews I fully plan on playing the games as the characters probably going to try and change Naomi's hair I don't really know how I'm going to I just don't look good in short wigs I never have done um, <laughs> but we'll see um, and if not then we'll see what else we can do if you can, make sure to stick around. I will also be playing Mad Father soon, uh, which is in the works, which I'm very excited about. If you guys know my father, uh, very much kind of the way same wavelength RPG kind of thing. Um, so yeah, if you guys could like and subscribe and share if you can, or turn on those notification bells. I don't really know this whole YouTube thing, okay? I'm used to TikTok. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you all later. ここ